morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual South Atlantic Conference Sabbath School Experience. We trust that you've had a wonderful week, and we recognize that even now as we usher in a new presidency, that we know the Spirit of God will lead us and lead our nation. We're delighted this morning to have with us virtually uh, Jessica Davison from North Carolina, and she's going to give us our welcome, and she's also one of our coordinators for Roundtable Connect. Jessica, good morning. The Roundtable Connect, as Pastor Howard mentioned, and it is so amazing to see platforms such as this that is impacting so many individuals all across our region, all across the U.S., and even around the world who are able to view our Sabbath school services and build community. And if you want to know more information about Roundtable Connect, you can view our promo video. Thank you, Jessica. Let's watch the video. What a year 2020 has been. This has been such unprecedented times with this global pandemic. And the social injustices and civil unrest. It's been really crazy this year. It really has been. And you know what I'm grateful for? What? I'm grateful to have a Christian community in the Roundtable Connect. Definitely. I can't believe that just a couple of friends getting together has now started this whole community that's now working in collaboration with the South Atlantic Conference. Of course, and we're able to expand it and bring it to you nationwide and yay, worldwide. The Roundtable Connect is a virtual young adult community from ages 18 to 35 that features compelling conversations on relevant Bible-based topics using the inverse Sabbath school lesson. We would love to have you join us. You can register all young adults at sacsda.org. And you can follow all of our social media pages at Roundtable Connect. Please join this young adult community. Join, join Roundtable, Roundtable Connect. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, if you Thank you very much, ladies, for that wonderful introduction to Roundtable Connect. If you have a young person and you want them to be a part of Sabbath School, we encourage you to um, log on to Roundtable Connect and be a part of the discussion. I promise you, you will not be disappointed by it. Again, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We are going to continue our discussion this morning on the book of Isaiah. It's been a vibrant discussion thus far. We've looked at leadership. We've looked at also challenges that communities of faith are oftentimes faced with. with. And so I'm looking forward to this morning's discussion. And to help us have that conversation this morning regarding leadership and the crisis that sometimes the people of faith face, we have a number of distinguished gentlemen with us this morning. I'll take a few minutes to introduce them. We have Dr. We have Dr. Um, Mortley. Dr. Mortley is a uh, professor of, at Tuskegee, the historic Tuskegee University down mm -hmm. there in Alabama. Um, then we have Dr. Um, Deshaun Preston. Dr. Preston um, is a distinguished, distinguished scholar. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Richard Williams. Dr. Williams is a published author. Um, Dr. Williams, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And of course, we have uh, Elder Roland Pinder. This morning, I think we are we, we are guilty of what the Trump uh, the Trump supporters call elite. We have a, uh, a number of elite <laughs> gentlemen with us this morning, so I'm looking forward to having that discussion this morning with these gentlemen. Um, Pastor McGraw, I don't know about you, but this week has been both historic as well as tragic. Right? This week, we yeah. had Pastor Howard mentioned in his introduction, we inaugurated the first female to the second in command, the Vice President Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. I want to make certain I say that name correctly. Yeah. Um, Kamala Harris, uh, it was an historic, um, historic event. But also this week we lost, we lost two icons. icons. We lost Hank, Hank Aaron, mm -hmm. and we also lost this morning um, the icon uh, Larry King, that great um, syndicated host on CNN. Um, so it's both historic as well as tragic, and I guess it fits in with our discussion this morning, the hard way. Um, help us understand what the hard way really means. 
Yeah, one of the things uh, that we're looking at this week is uh, the, the hard way. You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, you've, you've uh, heard the statement, you can either, you know, go the easy route or you can go the circuitous route yeah. or you can go the hard, hard way. way. <laughs> you know? And so, and, and that's what this lesson is going to be talking about. You know, the, the fact that um, when we go without God, we, we go on the hard route. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're going the hard way. And, you know, and I don't know about you, just be transparent. It's hard enough, and I'm with God. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, just imagine how hard it'd be without God. Yeah. You know, because, you know, the things, because the thing about it is, with all that I go through, the Lord is still with me. Even when I go through my hard times, God is there and showing, showing his hand. But when we look at uh, this week's lesson, uh, the memory text says, I will wait on the Lord. And a lot of times we don't wait on him. Mm -hmm. We always like to try and go ahead of him. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, classic uh, narratives in the Bible is with uh, Abraham and Sarah, you know, the, uh, you know, wait, I say on the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't wait on the Lord. Um, and we see what happened to them. And, and, you know, even though they have that example, I have my own example in my own life. And, and I'm sure so many of you uh, are the, the same way. It says, I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Now, when we look at this week's lesson, Sunday starts out talking about uh, when we look at uh, the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, it's easy to lose faith. Mm -hmm. It's easy to lose faith. Yeah. You know, um, even when we're close to the Lord, there are things that pop up in our life. And we just wonder, God, where are you? Mm -hmm. Lord, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why are you allowing this to happen to my family? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, uh, Sunday also wants us to look at, what can we do? What can we do personally to learn to keep our faith intact? So that when tomorrow's calamities come, how can we stay firm? And then on Monday, it talks about when we keep uh, refusing the invitations of God and, and, uh, and refuse to be loyal to him and turning down his freely offered deliverance. What road has that taken us to? You know, we, we're going dis to discuss that. And then on Tuesday, one thing that I got hope on Tuesday there are limits to what the enemies of God's people are allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to cover that. And on Wednesday, it says, true fear of God as a holy one, to recognize him as the ultimate power of the universe, that's what we need to do. You know, to fear God, to revere him, not be afraid of him. And that's what's, you know, with a lot of us, we uh, tend to be afraid of God as far as, okay, you know, he's looking to do something wrong, mm -hmm. you know, to, to punish me. And then on Thursday, disobedience and disloyalty to God will keep us from being accepted into God's kingdom. So let's go ahead and get started into the lesson. Yes, thank you very much for that overview. And, and Sunday talks about fulfillment of prophecy, prophecy fulfilled. If you remember last week, we discussed the names of Emmanuel and, of course, uh, Isaiah's second son, Mahershala Hasbaz, right? And so those two Very names, good, basically, you, yes, you, you, I you practiced the entire week. Seven I, I days wish you'd call me so right? I practice, so don't ask me to say it. <laughs> so, so Isaiah basically <laughs> sons meant um, some things will happen. Some things will happen that God is with us as well as the fact that some calamity will befall the children of Israel. And if you put those two names together, it basically communicates the message for Sunday, um, which is that calamity will fall but God is with you. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's the message that God basically wanted to communicate. Now, we, what, what's happening in Sunday is rather interesting. Um, and we can see the consequence of Sunday in, played out in John chapter 4. When the lady, the Samaritan woman, came to Jesus at the well, um, she said what relationship or what dealings Samaritans have with Jews, and that is a result of what transpires here in, um, in, 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 on Sunday, or in 7th century um, B.C. Um, before Christ, when Israel, the northern tribe, was taken over by Assyria mm -hmm. and destroyed. And, of course, the Assyrians uh, brought a number of people from Mesopotamia to live in Samaria. As a result of that, Israel lost its both its um, national identity as well as its ethnic purity. And so they became the Samaritans as a result. 
And so what happens here as a result of Israel's destruction is you see this, there is sometimes some kind of hardship the people experience, the people experience. And here's the question that I want to bring the panel in on this morning. What can we do now? What can we do now in our present circumstances to prepare, to prepare us for when tragedy um, befalls us in the future? What, what are some of the things that we can do today that will help us to deal with challenges in the future. And if you live long enough, you will experience challenges. Nobody is without challenge, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so I'm going to start with um, uh, the first time guest here this morning, Dr. Williams. I don't want all our panel members to address this. What are some things that we can actually do this morning or today to prepare us for the future? Dr. Williams? So Dr. Mil Williams, you're on mute. Okay, we're having a little difficulty here in Dr. Williams. Let's go on to uh, Dr. Preston. Dr. Preston, what are some things that we can do um, until we're able to rectify his challenges? What are some things that we can do to prepare for future ch challenges that we may face? Sure. Uh, I'll give uh, two, two things right, that I think um, will help. One spiritual, another one is practical, right? So uh, the, spiritual, the spiritual aspect of things, I, I say you should ground yourself in the word of God and in scripture, right? And just hark on the promises God have left us. And it's very obvious, right, within the Sabbath school lesson, because God left Israel a promise uh, with Isaiah, God with us, that he showed that through all of your tests and trials, um, that you, that God will be with you. And then the practical piece, right, is I would say surround yourself with a support system, mm -hmm. uh, a group of people who are like-minded, who are intentional and trying to go the same places you're trying to go, trying to have that same spiritual relationship that uh, that you are striving to have with Christ, right? And and that that support group will help you in that time of need and in those trials to provide some encouragement and support and support to kind of help you through. And I think that those uh, two things, and I'm sure the rest of our panelists would give some other examples, but those are two things: one spiritual and one practical that. I think we really help. Wow, that's deep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we've never really looked at our friendships, right? But it's important. Dr. Williams, let's come back to you, Dr. Williams. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Preston. I think that the lesson had made it clear that if we put faith in the promises and of God, we can be assured and be um, comforted in, 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 that, in, that, in that state. If we just look at the things that are um, facing us, it's going to overcome us. Yeah. But if you know the answer, you know how it's going to end. If you know the end of the story, then you rest with the um, uh, with with the consequences. If we don't know the end of the story, then there's frustration. So I think with God giving us the information, how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and where it's going to happen, we can rest assured that we can go through it. And I think that is the comforting uh, thing that we have, uh, um, uh, and God has given us this in his word. Yeah, so knowing yeah. the end of the story. And, and also, uh, uh, to go along uh, with, with what's been said so far, uh, I, I really think that we should uh, recognize and know the tactics of the enemy, and also who our real enemy is. The en the, the, you know, the enemy is Satan. And, and one thing about the Assyrians, the Assyrians had a policy of scattering subject people into local populations. And it was designed to obliterate, like you said, old national identities and loyalties. Mm -hmm. So they, they were going to break the loyalty that they had to uh, whomever they were worshiping mm -hmm. or, 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 or the, you know, whatever they were doing. And so with that, we had to realize that, you know, um, um, Satan has the same tactics. And I like what um, uh, Dr. Preston said, you know, the fact that, you know, he tries to do the same. He does the same thing with us. He will introduce um, people mm -hmm. or groups to us. Mm -hmm to get us to break our allegiance with God. Mm -hmm. Because young or old, mm -hmm. peer pressure is real. Mm -hmm. you, know, we, we, you know, we like to assimilate, we like for people to, uh, to like us. Mm -hmm. but, but in this, you know, uh, this is what, you know, the Assyrians, this was their policy. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, uh, also for those who don't know, this is where the Samaritans, that, that, that race came from, mm -hmm. because of their assimilation into, 
you know, other nationalities. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very good point that these gentlemen have made so far. And we'd love to hear from Elder Pinder. Elder Pinder, what are some things that we can do to prepare for the future? We've heard about keeping our, uh, making certain our friends are aligned with our beliefs. We also heard that we need to know the end of the story as well as um, keep our faith grounded in the Bible. Elder Pender, what are some of the things that you think that we can do besides what have been said so far that will help us face the challenges that confront us in the future? I think you and Dr. Williams said it very well. It's about faith. We have to learn how to increase our faith. And the only way we can do that is by trying and testing and proving God. Mm. Like the way the writer of this story started out uh, the introduction telling the story of the little blind girl on the fourth floor of a burning building. When the firefighters couldn't get to her yet, they called out to her to trust and believe. If she would just jump, they would save her with a net that was set up. She didn't have faith in them because she didn't know them. Mm. But when she heard her father's voice, mm. her faith made her bold. Mm -hmm. And she was able to jump and be saved and have no harm. And we have to learn how to cultivate or develop that type of faith in God and trust in him. And the only way we can do that, by hearing and knowing his voice, yeah. being able to distinguish his call from that from the devil. And that's a powerful point, Elder. That's a powerful point. Knowing the voice of God. I mean, and that's the thing. Sometimes we take for granted that we really have faith. Um, but when hard times come, we realize that we really don't. And that's because we do not spend every single waking moment of the day cultivating that relationship with the Lord. Let's bring in um, Dr. Um, Mortley. Dr. Mortley, help us understand. Add something else that we've not looked at so far. Uh, you're on more mute, down, Dr. Mortley. Yes, I'm sorry. I concur with the, my fellow panelists. I'd just like to add this, that um, as we are trusting, as, as our faith is being exercised, we should also come to the, um, the realization that it will still not be an easy road, mm -hmm. right? And as the song says, you know, salvation's worth some scars we may lose a battle now and then you know but we know the victory mm -hmm. is ours and as we exercise our faith as we trust we know we'll have um obstacles but we can rest assured you know that god says he will never leave us nor forsake us and, and that is important that is the realization that challenges is a part of the Christian journey. Uh, and right. thank you very much, Dr. Mortley, for reminding us that as long as you live, you as a person will experience difficulties. And once you realize that, when challenges come your way, you will not lose heart because you know right. that this is just a part of what it means to be a Christian, right? And the Bible exactly. says it. The Bible says it clearly um, in Pauline writings. It says what a good, uh, a good soldier of Christ will suffer persecution. So realizing that that is a part of who we, the journey that entails, or that is a part of the journey, so, then so, we can so, deal with the, the challenges that come ahead. So is it how we look at things? Is, 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 does that make a difference? That's essentially what it is. Yeah. We, we have to look at it um, as a part of the experience and not an exception. I'm glad you asked that question, Pastor. I heard it stated by one theologian, faith isn't as we sometimes understand it, but faith is seeing things as God sees them. Mm -hmm. mm. And when we see things through God's eyes, it will give us a different perception yeah. of life and events. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think with that with that perspective, Elder Pinder, we will embrace we will embrace challenges that they, as they come. We will see them as opportunity for growth. I see um, Dr. Preston shaking his head. We will see these things as opportunities for growth. Um, Dr. Preston? Oh, um, sure, yeah, I, 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 I definitely concur, right? I think some of it is, and with that faith, right, your perspective changes. Um, 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 you know, as an infant or as a child, right, you, you tend to blame other people or you try you tend to see life as not being fair right you question a lot of things and not saying that questioning is a bad part right because questioning 
is a part of that 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 growth and, and, and maturing your faith. But it is then changing that perspective and looking at it as, hey, this situation might have happened because God is preparing me for something else. Right. Or God is preparing me for something greater. Um, you know, or this situation happened because God is using me to reach other people and to be an example for him. And so so oftentimes, right, uh, as Christians, our perspectives in lives and how we approach things and, and things that even happen to us changes. Uh, and to, to Dr. Pender's point, um, we see it as God sees it. Right. And we see the intent behind it and what God was trying to do and how God was trying to use us and to grow us as Christians. Yeah, and, and with that, uh, um, sometimes I have to look back and say, Lord, open my eyes so that I can see. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm still focused on, on the obvious. Yeah. I want to see it, through, you know, like, like uh, Dr. Penner said, through, through God's eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that diagnosis, that, that terrible diagnosis will not destroy our faith. Uh, being laid off from our job will not destroy our faith. Our children acting a certain way will not destroy our faith. Whatever may come. Um, we will see it differently because our perspective is informed by the fact that God is in charge, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is and and these are tools that He uses to to grow us as individuals. Let's move on to Monday as we segue into Monday. Um, Monday's lesson talks about foreseen consequences. Foreseen consequences. Um, Dr. Mortley, help us understand what are, what were the consequences that were um, discussed before that should, uh, Israel should have known before they, they, they actually happened. All right, thank you. This, I think, is uh, a great contrast uh, in leadership or leadership styles. Because sandwich, there we see King Achaz, who was sandwiched between his father, who the Bible says did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and his son, who also did right in the sight of the Lord. So we see the individual's response to salvation, so to speak. And, um, and clearly now, um, is uh, Judah now at this time, of course, the southern kingdom, they uh, had the benefit of the prophet Isaiah. Their God was right at their right hand, you know, just to take advantage of that opportunity, and they did not. But God promised, hey, you know, you know, the kings of of of, of Assyria, um, sorry, of uh, Samaria and um, Syria, they're going to come and destroy Judah. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? And He assured the king that it will not stand, it will not come to pass. But there are certain things you have to do. And if you refuse to do so, then these are the consequences. And Isaiah told him that uh, uh, God will visit judgment upon them. In fact, he used the, 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 the symbolism of a fly, of a stinging fly, you know, and the bee that stings. So clearly, they would be taken into exiles. Their land would be ravaged if they did not turn around and, and heed the pleadings that of, of the prophet. That God was sending them. Yeah, and and, and one of the things I want to uh, ask is is this: What's the difference between fear and being scared? And mm -hmm. also, what 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 should be our reaction to each one of them, as far as a Christian is concerned? What's the difference between fear and being scared? And how should we how should we uh, handle or um, react to each one of them? Or, or how does it make us react? Who, who would like to answer that? So fear and... Um, fear and being scared. Being fear and being uh, scared. Okay. Yeah, All right. All right. So that's a question. What is the difference between being um, fearful and being scared? Yeah. Um, or, or you want to say afraid. Uh, or afraid, right? Yeah. Fear, um, and, fear and being afraid. Let's, let's ask well, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Um, Dr. Williams that question. What's the difference, Dr. Williams, between being fearful and being afraid or being scared? Uh, I think you're on mute, Dr. Um, Williams. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. I think, um, I think um, that, 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 that word is sometimes um, interchangeable with two different meanings. Uh, fear, as it relates to God, is one of respect. Um, you know, I feared my mother, 
uh, even though she was a small lady, yeah, when she told you. me at age 55 to take my hands out of my pocket, and uh, I took my hands out of my pocket, even though I was a man with children, because I fear my mother. I respect her. And, and when she tells me to do something, I respond to that. I fear her. I'm not afraid of her, but I fear her. Now, afraid, being afraid is when I feel something is threatening to my being. Um, we fear God, not because God is going to destroy us, but because God is our maker, he's our creator, and he deserves the respect of his position. So that's, that's one fear. Being afraid is different. Okay, that's a very good distinction there, mm -hmm. uh, being a, uh, fearful and being afraid. I've never really looked at it like the way you've asked it. Let's ask this question. What, what we see here, let's, what we see here happening here um, is that there are, there are consequences to the decisions that leaders oftentimes make. Um, what is clear is that Ahaz and um, the, the, the kings of Israel were not the only ones impacted by the decisions that these leaders made but the entire people were affected by it. In fact, the Sabbath School Quarterly said that they had to eat um, like nomads. Their agricultural was destroyed completely by Assyria. And so we see that they had to, their, their lifestyle was disrupted. We also saw in the, north, the southern kingdom that when Assyria came in, they basically had to pay more money in taxes to, to meet the demands of Tiglath Pileser. It was like and protection money. Exactly. And so what <laughs> happens is that we see that when, the, when, when leaders make a decision, it oftentimes impacts the, the general society. And we saw that last year when, one, when our leader chose not to be honest about the, the, the deadly or the virus, so many people actually lost their lives because they were not given the actual, the correct information. So we see there's a relationship between the decisions that leaders make and the effects that um, people face. And so let me ask this question, um, Dr. Uh, Elder Pender. Is it a moral obligation to challenge our leaders? And if so, how should we go about doing that? As we live today, I would say yes there is a moral obligation, if not to challenge them on the substance of what they do and say and their policy, but challenge them on the spiritual relationship it has with life itself. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, there was a confluence of information regarding, as you said, the pandemic. And should we wear masks or should we not wear masks? Should we uh, 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 socially distance or should we not socially distance? The consequence of following bad leadership can lead to death. Mm -hmm. Over 400,000 people cannot testify this morning mm -hmm. because they succumb mm -hmm. to the results of bad leadership. It is incumbent upon us to, to, to always look at information. God has never left us void of information. He has given us information to read, information to study. We have historical perspective. We also have the ability to connect with the Holy Spirit. There are a group of people today that are still being misled and misguided because they have not put their trust in God, but they're putting their trust in men, or at least a man. Yeah, yeah that's deep. That's well said, sir. Well said, well said. Um, does anyone want to address that? Um, is it a moral obligation to basically um, speak to the, the truth to power? Um, Dr. Williams? Uh, no, I, was just rubbing, I just rubbed my face, but okay. <laughs> no, well, I, I think that um, Paul, Paul, Paul points out that the system that God has given us, the government, is, is, is uh, um, ordained. And, and, and I, th I think a lot of times we uh, confuse those who are carrying out the system with the system. The people that are assigned to the system are not necessarily ordained. The system is. And when the people deviate from that system uh, by lies or by their behavior, we're not obligated at that point to, uh, to support them. We are supportive and should be supportive of the system, uh, the system which should be uh, a benefit for all people. 
and we elect people or we select people into those positions to carry that out. When they do not carry it out, we're not obligated to follow uh, uh, their deviation. Right. And I think the Bible makes that clear uh, throughout that uh, uh, there are times in which you do not follow those that are in, in leadership positions. Right, very so good. Do Thank you. Dr. And Monday. that's the point, sorry, I was thinking of as well, because even at that time in Judah, you had, even though Akaz had locked up the church and all of those things, you had Levites there who were still worshipping to the light that they have. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. was then the nucleus that Hezekiah drew on when he came in. They were still in Judah. But they stuck to God because they knew that God would deliver them. So you always have that remnant there. Yeah. I, yeah. Have, a, I have a question to throw into the mix. Is this a result of us living in God's permissive will as opposed to his divine will? As we know, when the children of Israel came out of the wilderness and they saw all the countries about them, they asked to have a king mm -hmm. because they wanted to be like the other countries. And God told them, if you want to have this, there's going to be a consequence mm -hmm. or a price you will have to pay. Mm -hmm. And I think we're still living under the consequences of that choice. Mm -hmm. God wanted to be our head, our leader. We should be under a theocracy. But now we're living in his permissive will as opposed to his divine will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and it's a very good point. And this is something that we need to understand as... Um, Christians a part of this organization that we have a moral responsibility to help our leaders as well um, as our leaders have to help us um, the Bible says, iron sharpen iron in, all, in other words sometimes we deviate from the path as leaders all of us who are on the panel right here our leaders at, at times we basically deviate from what we know to be true and so it is incumbent upon the entire church to make certain that we stay on the right path Imagine what Israel would have looked like if the people had said to their leadership, no, we're not going to follow you. Imagine what would have happened to Judah if the people in Judah had said to Ahaz, I'm sorry, but what you're doing is wrong and we're not going to go that um, direction. I believe that Judah and Israel would have actually been saved, the calamities they did experience, if the people had chosen to say, I'm sorry, but God's will is different from what you're leading us. Well, and, and the question I have, you know, uh, when I listen to the words you said, challenge our leaders, mm -hmm. does that mean get nasty with them? Oh, no, but and that's why I say, in what manner do we do it? Well, well Do we it, go on Facebook and call them out? Do we, do we approach them privately? How do we address situation in the church when we disagree with what leaders do? Yeah, and also what, what moral, you know, and I may have missed it, you may have asked, but what moral obligation does a group or the congregation have when, when, it's go, when we're going down the wrong path? Because mm. one of the things that the lesson brings out, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the name of one of uh, Isaiah's sons, I believe, you know, a remnant shall return. You know, and, and just like it was brought out, you know, e even though it seemed like the, the whole nation was going down the wrong, the wrong uh, path, mm -hmm. there was a, a small group mm -hmm. that was still uh, worshiping God and, and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And it was told, you know, as far as them, you know, as far as like the, the curds and honey, mm -hmm. God was going to provide, take care of them. He, he's going to give them what they, what, what they needed mm -hmm. in order to survive and to bring them back. Mm -hmm. So, so my thing as far as, uh, you know, the, the, the challenging, um, how, how can we inform the membership or, or people or a person the appropriate way as to how to uh, challenge leadership mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, that's a, and, and, and be respectful. And that's a very good point because I've, I've been in bo board meetings, I've been in board meetings and where mm -hmm. members basically disagree with the decision that leadership makes and basically they've been very, yeah. very, very uh, abusive and disrespectful and mean. I've been but in, I've but been we, in we do meetings. have an obligation mm -hmm. to, as members, to make certain that leaders stay in the right path. But mm -hmm. equally important is how we do it. Equally important is that we, okay. we make certain that whatever we do is in line with God's will, right? And so it's important. Yep. Let's move on to 
um, Tuesday's lesson. Let's move on to Tuesday's lesson. What is in a name? What is in a name? Um, Dr. Preston, help us understand what is in a name. Sure. Um, this, this lesson was a bit, I don't want to say complicated, but complex, right? Because essentially, um, it, it's a mixture of a number of things. Uh, I would say it was a mixture of God's grace, his mercies, um, and then also his faithfulness, right? And so essentially, God used the prophet Isaiah and his sons to deliver various messages to his people. And so Mahersala has baths, uh, essentially, which uh, I guess that the Sabbath school lesson gave it to about two or three meanings, right? Which could be swift as booty, speedy as prey, and speed to spoil. And uh, uh, essentially, right, God, um, to go with uh, Monday's lesson, says there will be consequences for the choices that Judah has made, right? And so because you did not take the signs, which was God's grace and mercy, right, to say, hey, take the gentle route, um, we are going to allow Assyria to overpower you. And this will happen before uh, Isaiah's son is able to say, uh, to call for his mother or his father. Um, and, and for me, right, that was, it was, it was interesting because even in, in our disobedience or in, in Israel's disobedience to God, God still was faithful and, and, and gracious in one, providing a warning, right, by letting them know something will happen to you because of your actions. But uh, even more importantly, right, God did not hesitate. I mean, God didn't stop there with his grace and his mercy. He also then allowed for Isaiah to name another son, which um, Dr. Uh, well, not Dr., excuse me, uh, Elder McGraw mentioned earlier uh, in referring to a remnant will come. And then, of course, as last week, as we spoke about last week, Isaiah, God is with us. So even throughout the process, right, God showed several, several promises that even in the midst of, of tr uh, trial and turmoil and the, the, the overtaking of Assyria, that a remnant was coming. Mm -hmm. And even while you're through this process, God is with us, right? He is with you for those who remain faithful and, and decide to follow what God has said. Um, and so for me, right, I, I think it all came together in the various names, right? And so God spoke through the names. And, um, you know, back then, at least at that time, right, names were very, you thought, you thought about them, you thought through them. Sometimes, right, we weren't naming children until weeks, months, until after they were born, right, because names had those meanings. And it was important uh, that God found different ways to communicate with his people. And the names just happened to be one of them in this instance. Yes, and um, you, you're absolutely right, the remnant. And the concept, Dr. Preston, that keeps coming to my, I kept coming to my mind this week as I read this lesson was a concept of uh, redemptive judgment, redemptive judgment, um, which basically is that um, all of God's judgment is for a particular purpose, and that purpose is to save us. So God's judgment is never really punitive for the sake of punishment. It's always for the purpose of salvation. Uh, Dr. Williams, let me ask you this question. I read this statement this week. It says, it is also intended to characterize judgment as an essential component of redemption. An essential component of redemption. What do you think about that statement? That Let me read it again. It's also intended to characterize, that's redemptive judgment, is intended to characterize judgment as an essential component to redemption what do you think about that statement well i think it's 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 consistent with the overall process of saving there has to be honesty there has to be accountability and accountability uh, demands judgment um uh, god has he goes out of his way to make sure that we respond to to the, to the expected behavior but when we continually resist continually resist then it becomes upon God to to rectify what has been ignored and the ultimate um, um, outcome of ignoring God's principles is judgment um, and and so 
uh, for God not to inflict judgment means that God is not finishing the process of purification. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he's trying to do is he's trying to purify the universe through this, uh, this, this um, uh, uh, um, Christ-Satan um, uh, controversy. And then eventually it will be clean because there's been mercy, there's been judgment, there's been all of the elements that's necessary for salvation. So judgment is 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 a is a, um, um, a, a an important component, and I think we in our our lives also, and I think a lot of times why we have um, um, behaviors to continue is because we have the element of of um, you know we don't mind uh, being patient, we don't mind being um, uh, you know soft and all that, and those those elements are good too, but it also takes the hardness part in order to, to, to rectify. Every process um, uh, requires also some hurt. When a seed is placed in the ground, uh, it breaks open. It's, it, it's, 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 it's agitated so that it can grow and become eventually an ear of corn. And that's the way it is in our lives. But if that ear of corn refuses to, to, um, to develop, eventually it, 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 uh, it, it, it just it, uh, dissipates. And that's the way it is in, in judgment. Judgment comes as a result of event of, of continually uh, resisting uh, the grace that God offers. Uh, yeah, it, it, and and I, I like the way you put that. It made me think about something. And uh, uh, Dr. Mortley, I want to uh, direct this question to you. In what Dr. Williams uh, just said, how does that apply to us when it comes to the investigative and the executive judgment right um of course you know as as has been said judgment is not to necessarily uh, meet out a, a, a punitive or a punishment mm -hmm. it is to establish truth from error right from wrong you know if you have back to the great controversy you know, we're, we're all, we're Satan accuses God and accuses Christ of all of these things. And God wants to say, hey, here it is. Here is my people. And here are those who chose to be on the other side. This is true, you know. And certainly the Bible says we, judgment will begin at the house of God. We all have to face this judgment. And the, there is an investigative judgment that is going on where where records are being um, examined mm -hmm. <clears throat> to see whether one's name remains in the Lamb's Book of Life. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and that is basically an, an, an umbrella to then say, yeah. you know, one following the will of God for, through, you know, from conversion, sanctification, and so on and so forth. So that is going on. And so when Christ shall have returned, then all of that will have been decided, you see. And after that now comes the executive phase of the judgment where the Bible tells us, I think in Revelation 20, that all will be gathered, you know, they're the dead, you know, and so on. And they'll be judged out of those things written in the book. Amen. And so it's basically what you're saying is that God loves you uh, to accept you as you are, but right. he loves you too much to leave you as you are. And in, 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 in that sense, then you will experience some difficulties in your life. And the purpose of that is not to destroy you or to communicate hatred, but to communicate his love to develop you and to grow you and to mature you. And so we look differently on it. Let's move quickly on to Wednesday. We only have six more minutes remaining. Uh, Wednesday, talks about, Wednesday talks about the knowing nothing to fear when we fear God himself. Nothing to fear when we fear God himself himself. Elder Pender, help us to understand what that means. The best way I can help you understand that is uh, I was just thinking about um, my relationship with my father. And uh, my father set strict guidelines of how we as his children were supposed to carry ourselves, how we were to conduct ourselves, doing our chores, doing everything he asked us to do. And as long as we did those things, there was always love. There was always love. But when we felt ourselves afoul of his rules, we would have to pay a cost. Mm -hmm. And 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 sometime it was exacted out 
uh, uh, out of love in, 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 in a way in which you didn't want to go afoul of his rules anymore. But because of love, uh, uh, because of respect, and I think someone said early on, uh, loving their mother, uh, Dr. Williams, loving your mother, not, not wanting to be disrespectful. We will, when we have a true love, when we have a true understanding of God, we don't fear him. We don't fear him. I th the lesson talks about uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, when he spoke to the nation after it had gone through a, a devastating economic time. He, he said to the nation, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And I think Ellen G. White said, we have nothing to fear lest we forget how God has led us in the past. And, 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 and I can't emphasize that enough. When you have God leading you and guiding you and you have a relationship, you have nothing to fear because he will be there with you. Whether you're going through the floods or through the fire, he's going to be there. And that comes out of a knowledge of him, a respect for him, and a trying of him. I don't think there's anything else to say about that. Mm -hmm. It was wonderfully said. Um, let's quick, we'll quickly move on to Thursday's lesson, which talks about gloom of the ungrateful living dead. Gloom of the ungrateful living dead. Um, Dr. Williams, help us understand what that means. Uh, the grateful dead. That's almost uh, the ungrateful. I was thinking about the group, the grateful dead. Uh, the ungrateful dead. Um, uh, the the um, the meaning based on what's um, in um, uh, Isaiah um, 8, uh, 16 to 20, uh, it's clear. That is, these people were not grateful um, to what God had done. God had been so, um, I mean, he did everything for them. You know, and, and you're starting from verse 16, it, it, uh, it talks about uh, buying up the testimony of, um, uh, seal up the uh, law, and then he goes on to and 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 then he goes on to say later on in twenty to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. So they had the the, the all they needed in order to comply, and God went out of His way for them, but they took their eyes off of God, looked at the Assyrians, um, emulated the Assyrians. And even um, uh, Azaz, he was so um, so bold that he took um, um, God's uh, um, tabernacle and and desecrated in such a way that really was a slap in God's face, and and God still um, kept his his promise through Judah, even though Azaz probably go to hell, excuse me, but through his um, lineage, um, Israel still will, will, uh, was maintained until the Messiah came um, of Jew. He was just, they were ungrateful, so ungrateful, so much so, I mean, it's like your child going down the street to get some advice against what you've already, as a father, given and 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 knowing that that person is nothing has, has doesn't have that child's interest in mind, it's that kind of being just just being ungrateful. And I think Israel, uh, under Azar's leadership, epitomized uh, what ungratefulness is, and that's why I think he was the worst king that Israel ever had. Uh, and unfortunately, the people followed him. Uh, and and, and well said, ungratefulness sir. Ungratefulness well is when. Well said, Juan. Well said. Um, that, that is the point, that God has always been faithful to us. Even when we have been unfaithful to him, he's always been our Emmanuel. And, and the thing about it, he, he's uh, so gracious and long-suffering, he's given us time to get our act together. Yeah. You know, because when we look at, you know, this week's lesson, mm -hmm. it talks about even though these things were prophesied would happen, uh, were going to happen, there was a time gap. Just think what would happen if they had turned around. Because when we think about Nineveh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, you know, Jonah hit, he hit the streets uh, preaching. He said, "How many days? Uh, forty days." Yeah, forty days. Forty days, and 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 uh, you're gonna be overturned. But yes. but but they turned uh, themselves around, and that's one thing we have to look at uh, today. God has given us time. He's long suffering. He's given us invitation after invitation. 
So we need to turn our lives around so that we uh, can be saved. And I'm excited about that because no matter how many I times I've messed up, I know that God is going to be with me. And so I thank you for joining us this week. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us this morning. Um, have a good week. God bless you. We're looking forward to seeing you um, next week. Stay safe. And we'll, uh, we, we'll meet you back here next week. At this yeah, time. wash your hands, wear your mask, social distance, right. and do other precautionary things because this is real. God bless you all and have a great Sabbath. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Children's Church here at the South Atlantic Conference. I'm Dr. Big Guy, and it's a joy to welcome you. And we want to just remind all of our parents that your children can participate in our memory verse. All you need to do is just record them and then send it to sacinfo at sacsda.org. Again, that's sacinfo at sacsda.org. And we're delighted each and every week when we have wonderful children sharing with us. By the way, on every third Sabbath of the month, we have the South Atlantic Conference Virtual Children's Church. That's an exciting time from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. We have dynamic teachers from all across the conference that come online and virtually just interact with your children. And all you need to do is just go to our conference website and register. It's a free registration, and you will receive the Zoom link for the Virtual Children's Church. Again, that is the third Sabbath of each month from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. And we look forward to having your children be a part. Again, we want to say welcome, and this is Dr. Big Guy, and reminding you, always wear your mask when you go out, and remember to stay six feet apart, and always wash your hands. Until next time, may God bless you. Hello, boys and girls. This is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story for you called Friend to All. The memory verse is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says, Be kind to one another. The message is we serve God when we are kind. The Bible doesn't give us details about Jesus' childhood but based on what we do know about Jesus, let's imagine how he may have been as a child. Most families where Jesus lived had at least one animal. Can you guess what that animal was? A donkey! Donkeys are very strong animals. They are good at carrying things. When Jesus' family went somewhere, Jesus probably helped Joseph pack a bag with food and clothes for their donkey to carry on its back. Jesus probably cared for his family's donkey. He made sure that the donkey had food and water. When the work was done for the day, Jesus would lead the donkey to a resting place. If Jesus saw some children teasing an animal, he asked them to stop. If the animal looked hungry, he gave it some food. He always touched the animals gently. Horses came to the fence when he passed by. Cats liked to brush by his legs. Dogs wanted to lick his hand. Even wild animals liked Jesus. A wild animal is one that lives outdoors and doesn't have an owner. Squirrels probably started chattering when they saw Jesus, as if to say, Hello, Jesus! Rabbits may have sat up on their haunches and wiggled their ears when he walked by. If Jesus saw a baby bird that had fallen out of its nest, he probably put it back. And the mama bird may have sung an even prettier song, as if to say, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus liked to watch insects, too. He liked to watch caterpillars, ants, and ladybugs. He let them crawl on his hand, and he never stepped on them. Jesus liked looking at all the beautiful things God had made. He studied the stars and moon at night. He watched the flowers grow and the trees bud. He sometimes brought pretty flowers to his mother. 
Jesus loved people most of all. He didn't like to see anyone get hurt. If a person hurt another, he found a way to make the hurting person feel better. He shared his food with people who were hungry. If someone was thirsty, he gave them a cup of water. Jesus played with children that no one else liked. He visited people who had no families. People liked to be around him. He sang songs as he did his work. It made his neighbors feel good to hear him. Jesus never destroyed flowers or grass. He was gentle to the earth. Jesus was kind to every person and every other living thing. Everyone was happier when Jesus was around. Hi everyone, it's Aunt Frenita. Today's story is called Heavenly Visitors. The memory verse is from Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Today's message is God wants me to speak out for others. Do you talk to God when someone you care about needs help? Do you ask God to do something for them? Even when people are bad, we can speak out for them. A long time ago, Abraham bargained with God for some people. It happened like this. One hot day, Abraham sat in the shade of his tent, looking out upon the valley where he lived. A movement caught his eye. Three men stood just beyond his camp, talking together. Abraham jumped up, ran out to meet them, and bowed low. Please, stay a while at my tent. I will give you water and some food to eat. You can sit in the shade of the trees and rest. Thank you, we will, the men agreed. Go, do as you have said. Abraham hurried back to the camp and into his tent. Sarah, he called to his wife, we have some guests. Please bake some bread for them. Then Abraham hurried to get food for his servant to cook. Soon the food was ready. Abraham himself served his guests. While they ate, he stood in the shade of a tree nearby. And Sarah stayed just inside the tent where she could listen to the men. Where is your wife, Sarah? One of the guests asked. She's in the tent, Abraham answered. Next year, at this time, she will have a son, the guest said. Back in the tent, Sarah chuckled. <laughs> Imagine a son at her age? Why did Sarah laugh? The stranger asked. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now both Abraham and Sarah knew that their guest was the Lord himself. When Abraham's guests finished their meal, they got up to leave. As was the custom, Abraham walked a short distance with them. The Lord stopped to talk to Abraham as the others walked on. I have heard how very wicked Sodom is, the Lord said. Abraham had heard of evil things that people did in Sodom. He thought of Lot and his family who lived there. Abraham loved his nephew's family. He was sure Lot was not wicked, but Abraham worried about the people of Sodom. Many of them did not yet know God. Lord, Abraham said, are you going to destroy the good people of Sodom along with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty good people in Sodom. Will you not save the city? The Lord answered, If I find fifty righteous or good people in Sodom, 
I will not destroy it. Abraham thought some more. His kind heart made him ask the Lord again, What if there are only forty-five good people? I will not destroy Sodom if there are forty-five good people. Still, Abraham was not satisfied. Three more times he asked the Lord to save the city. The sixth time Abraham begged the Lord, Don't be angry with me, Lord, but let me ask one more time. Will you save the city for just ten good people? The Lord answered, For the sake of ten good people, I will not destroy the city. Then the Lord went on to Sodom, and Abraham went back to his tent knowing that God would do what was right and what was good. Good morning and welcome to the South Atlantic Conference virtual service. We are just so happy that you have decided to join us today. God has been good even through the difficulties. God is still a good God. Even though we may be going through some difficult and terrible times and, and we don't know when this thing is going to turn, we still have our hope in Jesus Christ because my hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So anything else that you may be holding on to that is not Jesus Christ, it is sinking sand. So today, no matter what is going on, we want you to put it aside. No matter what you may be going through, the difficulties, put it aside. Today, we are here to praise the name of of Jesus. And we know that if we look to him, he will come through for us. So today, sit back and enjoy the service that you will, will be streamed into your home. And we know today you will be blessed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let not your heart be troubled any longer. Let's worship in the presence of God this morning, Almighty God, and let's just rejoice and give thanks and sing.
We'd like to say good morning once again to all of you who are tuning in to our virtual worship service this morning. And this morning is time for prayer. I reminded that Abraham, he could not number the stars, but God, he knew them all by name. How much more God knows us. David said, oh Lord, you have searched me. Lord, you know me. Lord, you know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. Today, we don't know it all, but that's why I'm so glad that we can pray to a God who does. This morning, as we get ready for prayer, you may have a prayer request. What we want you to do, you need to, um, you know, we want you to let us know. You can do it via email, you can call it in, or, you know, right now, when we get ready to pray, if you have not provided to us, just reach your hand toward heaven or reach it toward the screen. Right now, we're going to pray to God. Let's bow our heads at this time. Our most kind, gracious, heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for being such a good God to us. Lord, you have been so good to us. You have extended mercy to us. Lord, we want to thank you for your kindness and thank you for your grace. Thank you for being long-suffering for us. Even though we were hard-headed times, Lord, you have put up with us. And Lord, you have continued to be with us and ask us to come back to you. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for your protections. And Lord, thank you most of all for your forgiveness. We come before you this morning asking for forgiveness of our sins. We want to say like the psalmist, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, we're asking that you restore unto me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit that will sustain me. Because Lord, Father, when you have done that, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Restore me, Father. This is my prayer. And Father, we come today praying for those who are sick. Somebody's sick, Lord, come by here. Somebody needs you, Lord, come by here. Lord, there is someone who is dealing today with cancer. Lord, there's someone today who is dealing with COVID. Lord, we ask that you will come by their room and let them know that you are near them. Lord, there's other sickness and diseases that we're dealing with. Diabetes, high blood pressure, stress, fear. Someone might even be dealing with addiction today. But Father, we know that you know our condition. And we ask, Lord, that you will stay near us. Come by today and be with us. And Father, there are some who are grieving today. There have been some funerals that have happened this week. There are some funerals that's going on today. And Lord, we have laid some loved ones to rest. But right now, we ask that you will stop by and give comfort. Lord, give strength for the journey. Lord, give us peace. Lord, give us a renewed vision of the second coming of Christ. We look forward to that day when he comes in the clouds. And Lord, all this death, all this sickness, all that's plaguing us now will be over. And Lord, we stop, pray that you will stop by some homes today. Lord, there are some families who are worried about their children. Lord, some people have sick children, and they've been praying that the fever will be overcome. Lord, there are some parents who are concerned about their children who have gone down the wrong path. Lord, we pray that you will bring them back. Lord, there are some children that are missing today. Lord, we ask that you will find them and restore them. Lord, there are some children who are strung out on drugs. Lord, we pray that you will give them the strength to overcome their addictions and their strongholds. Lord, we pray for the families. We pray for the parents. Give them comfort. Give them hope. And Lord, we pray for marriages. Lord, we want to thank you for those that are together. 
and those that are strong. But Lord, we want to lift those up who appear to be on their way to divorce. Father, we ask that you will let those couples know that you are a God that can heal broken relationships. Father, there is someone today who is in need of a financial blessing. And I'm asking that you will allow one of those cattle up on the hill to come down to the valley and make it to their front door and give them exactly what they need. Father, we pray for our country. Lord, this week, we inaugurated our 46th president, Joe Biden, and a new vice president, Kamala Harris. Father, we pray for the new administration that you will lead, guide, and direct them in the policies and decisions that they make. And Lord, we want to even pray for the outgoing administration. Lord, I pray for their salvation, and I pray for the decisions they're going to make. Lord, we pray today that you will heal our land. And Lord, we, take, we pray today that you will be with our service. We pray for our speaker, Pastor Melvin Preston. Lord, you have used him in the past, and you will use him once again today. I pray that you will help us to be ready to receive a word from you through him. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done for us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, now that you're already familiar with how tithing is a regular return of 10% from everything that God gives you, what about the offerings? What should trigger your decision to give promise, which is a regular and systematic return of offerings? Would it be a specific day on your calendar? Should it be every Sabbath? When there is gratitude in your heart or a call from the pulpit? When you know about a good project or even when you feel that it is the moment to give? Is there a biblical principle that you could use to determine when to bring your regular and systematic offering to God? Yes. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, we see a clear indication that both tithes and offerings are equally required and expected when there is an income. And the context also shows that not giving any of them would lead to separation from God and material ruin, as well as moral and spiritual decay. You can see that on verses 9 to 12. Solomon also provides a general principle about the regularity of offerings. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. What he means to say is that your promise or regular and systematic offerings should be given as first fruits, which is putting God first. It is the same system used for tithing. In other words, it should be the thing you set apart just after receiving any income or increase, right after your tithe and before any other expense may be met. So, the regularity with which we honor God with regular offerings should be established not by our feelings, relevant projects, or calls from the pulpit, but by the frequency of the increase or the income that He gives us. It's not a donation. It's not a method of evaluating church leaders. It's an act of worship. Ellen G. White, God's Messenger, also emphasizes this point when she says that this matter of giving is not left to impulse, God has given us definite instruction in regard to it. He has specified tithes and offerings as the measure of our obligation, and He desires us to give regularly and systematically. God is inviting us to adopt the right principles when giving regular offerings. He expects that we will no longer be moved by feelings, sympathy, projects, or calls, but by His giving. Giving regularly to Him, as regularly as He is blessing us, will make us more aware of His care and strengthen our connection with the Creator and Sustainer of all life. May we put our desires last and God first. This is my this joy, 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 joy to introduce to those who do not know Him and to present to those who do know Him the Speaker of the Hour. The Speaker of the Hour, I must confess, is very, very dear to me. I've known him all of my life, and the speaker of the hour has known me longer than I've known myself. I'm speaking of none other than my older brother, who is now the patriot of, of our family, uh, Mel Pastor Melvin Preston. Uh, he's my brother, 
But this morning I confess, he's also my friend. My brother is a very unique person. I'm not trying to get even with him by trying to say something about him like he would talk about me. Christians don't do that. But I got to tell you a little bit about him. He's a well-rounded person. Now, he's a well-rounded person. What do you mean by that, Pastor Preston? Well, it's simply, simply. He's a leader, but he could be your greatest member if he's a member of your church. He is a follower. He, he, he knows how to take a few orders, but he's also a little dictator. <laughs> he, he, he's nice as he wants to be. He would do anything for you and everything for you. But at the same time, he could be a little mean. He's kind. He's kind. I'm talking about the speaker of the hour. I'm talking about who God can mold and make and use. The speaker of the hour is as kind as he wants to be, as long as he's having it his way. <laughs> uh, but the speaker of the hour, God's man with God's message. God has used him over 40-something years pastoring in the Great South Atlantic Conference. He's pastored perhaps some of you, if you're a member of the uh, 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 Larnberg District, or if you're a member of the Newburn, North Carolina District, or if you're part of the Fayetteville, North Carolina family, or the Charlotte, North Carolina family, if you've been a member of the Decatur Church here in Decatur, Georgia, or the Lithonia uh, Church in Lithonia, Georgia, he has pastored you, he has perhaps made a difference in your life. Life, as he has so many others. He's preached around the world. God has used him, and God has certainly used him mightily in the South Atlantic Conference because he's been our family director for how many years? About 35 years has, has mended many of broken homes, have encouraged those who thought and contemplated divorce to stick together under God. That's our speaker. I'll speak as the husband of one wife, Joetta, who they've been married. God has blessed them to be together about 41 years. Three adult children, seven grandchildren. My brother, my friend, God's servant. After you would have been blessed in song by Sister Cecilia Horton from the West End Seventh-day Adventist Church, Atlanta, Georgia. God will give you a message from heaven today through his manservant, Pastor Melvin Preston. Hear he him. me 
I'm always thinking about how good you are But I don't always tell that it's in spite of myself You know I have been being good Some days I don't do what I should Yet your mercy somehow endures There's no other love that compares to yours it's hard to understand How you never repay me for what I deserve I thank you that you're not like man See, sometimes I desire to give her from her Yet I know that's not like you Yet this old flesh of mine tries to win every time I'm grateful your word is true You're faithful to see me through I'm always talking about the way you bless me Oh yes I am I'm always ready to sing about how good you are But I don't always tell that it's in spite of myself You know I have been being good Some days I, I don't do everything I should Yet your mercy somehow endures Your, your mercy is kind and it's good It's brand new every day is everlasting hey, hey, I'm always talking about The way you bless me Oh yes I am I'm always ready to sing about How good, how good you are but I don't always tell that it's in spite of myself. You know I haven't been, I haven't been good. Some days I, I don't do everything I should. Yet your mercy somehow. Lord, I thank you for your brand new mercy Every morning, your mercy Somehow, I don't deserve it But I thank you for your mercy Your mercy Somehow, in a doors Thank you for your mercy Good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. It's a great joy to be in God's house on this blessed Sabbath morning. And we thank you on the part of the South Atlantic Conference for inviting us into your home or wherever you are worshiping um, today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy this morning because I am the first speaker um, here at the South Atlantic Conference Virtual Worship Service uh, to speak to you under a new president of the United States. 
And I say, praise he the Lord. And uh, what a, oh, like the, like the commercial say, oh, what a relief it is. Uh, but God is still good. But we are looking beyond the White House. We are looking to the heavenly house this morning. There's a lot I can say this morning. Um, and every day, every now and then, I can really understand what my dad was telling me when he told me, uh, watch out for my little brother because he need help. And um, I, I understand. I, I really do understand. And so as you, in your prayers, just remember my brother Calvin because he need prayer. And as I was sitting there, listen to the introduction today, I was saying in my, I, I, the word came to my mind, take me to the water to be baptized because I really think. But one correction I want to make this morning because I, I, I know I'm going to hear it from my wife when I get home. Um, uh, my brother stated that I, we was been married for 41 years. I don't know how he made that big mistake because he'd been married 40, uh, uh, 44 years going on 45. And I was married a year before he was. So this year, my wife and I not married 41 years, but we've been married this coming year, be this year, 47 years. And, uh, and, and, and I would not take nothing for my journey, but it is so good to be with you. Just an announcement, uh, this Thursday is the last day you can register for our upcoming virtual marriage retreat. Uh, we have a treat for you. For those who have not registered, you do not want to miss out on this. So go to www.adventsource.org uh, this coming week and register we promise you it is going to be fantastic from Friday night and all day Sabbath. Then we're coming back Saturday night. Uh, we have a awesome date, what we call in date night, an awesome movie that we're going to show. We have a Christian comedian going to be with us and renewing of our vows and all on Saturday night. And, and then we'll wrap it up on a Sunday morning. So Please come and join us on this uh, on February the 12th through the 14th. The Bible tells us in Luke. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 25 through 29, and there went a great multitude with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower and set it not down first and count the cost, whether he has sufficient funds, sufficient to finish it? I would like to title uh, our message this morning, The Cost of the Cross. The Cost of the Cross. Let us pray. Father, our God, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are my rock and my strength. We pray in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The cost of your cross. Some of life lessons are hard. I say that again. Some uh, of life's lessons are hard. King Solomon said uh, we should train up a child. 
or train up a child for that very reason, because life is sometime hard. Preparation is the key to success. It is better to know where you are going and what the cost will be before you take the first step. Before you take the first step. Life can be hard. And, and as, as Solomon said again, uh, train up a child in the way that he should go. Um, and so when he's old or she's old, that they will not depart um, f from it. And I understand that text, not so much when I was coming up as a child, but when uh, my wife and I was bringing up our children. And now as we spend time with our grandchildren, uh, the, uh, that lesson in the parable told by Jesus Christ at this point is Christ's earthly ministry. Uh, the crowd that followed him was continually growing. Follow me this morning. It should have been a comfort to him to have so many disciples um, to follow, uh, follow him uh, continue, uh, and continuously growing. It, it, it should have been a comfort to him uh, uh, to walk uh, as they was walking towards the holy city. But Jesus was not focused on the present. He was looking to the future. Uh, he knew that he was on his way down the dusty road to Jerusalem uh, to die on the cross. He knew uh, that the large crowd that follow, uh, uh, followers will soon desert him. That's how it is even in today, Christian friends of mine. We find that some people, uh, they'll follow you when things are going good, but when things are getting tough, you look around and there no way to be, uh, no way to be, uh, uh, be found. That's just like growing up as a lad. Uh, I used to get into some big fights coming up and and sometimes I get whipped most of the time. But I remember one, 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 one time my, my, I, when I told my older, bro, older brothers uh, uh, about, uh, about some trouble that I was getting in and, and guys were taking advantage of me. And one day they met uh, at the bus stop. And beloved, I'm telling you, and when I came off the bus stop, off the bus that day, and I, and I knew my brothers, they was there. And, um, and I started talking bad to those who was, um, um, was, was, was chastising me and beating me up. And, and I told him, come on now, come on now, because I knew that my big brothers was behind me. And beloved, I think my brothers got tired of me talking a lot of trash. And, uh, and, as, the, and as the guys started coming towards me, I looked around and my brothers, they was gone. And beloved, I never ran so fast in my life. Um, um, but I want you to know, regardless of what situation is, knowing that God is ever uh, with us. He knew that his own disciple was abandoning him um, in this great uh, hour of need while he's suffering agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew uh, that he would be arrested and placed on trial. And he would knew, uh, he knew that he would die. Uh, his profound purpose of telling this parable was to warn his followers of the importance of spiritual resolve. Spiritual resolve requires the highest determination, a higher level of determination. You need a plenty of spiritual resolve if you desire to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Discipleship is difficult. We, we are called to take up our cross and follow Christ without knowing where our journey will take us or what the cost will be. The parable know as the parable of the towel of the builder. The Christ warning was to be prepared be like the good soldier in the army of the Lord. How does Jesus, how does Jesus 
this morning prepare us in this parable to face the, this, uh, to face the challenges of discipleship. There are three things in this allegory laid out in our consideration. Three points and I'll be through. First, true faith is costly. True faith is costly. To emphasize that the uh, to emphasize that discipleship is costly, Jesus used a strange example. He said uh, says that if you hate your own uh, that you hate your own family, even your own or your own life in order to be a disciple. On the surface, that seemed cruel. But let's take a closer look at the command. First, if a Jew hate his own family, it would be <coughs> uh, would be a, would would have been a violation of the law. Jesus was always admonishing others to fulfill the law, so he could not have meant for us to take the word literally. So what did he mean? Jesus was placing emphasis on the priority of love, of love. To be loyal to me, Jesus said, I must come, I must come before your family, even when, uh, even your own life in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37 we find Jesus saying these words, he that loveth a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Discipleship does come at a cost. Hear me, church. Discipleship does come at at a cost. Imagine for a moment, church, just imagine for a moment uh, 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 what would happen to the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ if after the crucifixion, these disappointed disciples went home to their families and told their old, uh, uh, lively, uh, 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 of their old livelihood. In fact, they, they tried, but Christ followed them to, to the shore where they was casting their nets. And, uh, and he showed them how important it was for them to be fishers of men. And they immediately, hear me church, and they immediately drop their nets uh, one more, once more. And this time, they follow their calling without looking back. I want you to know, Christian friends of mine, we are on a journey. We are on a journey. And the reason, the reason why we are, are, are suffering the way that we are is because too many of us, we are looking back instead of looking forward. Jesus is not in the back but he is in, the for, in front of us. So I want you to know today, if the, you, you want to bear your cross and the cost of your cross, you can't look back. You got to keep looking forward. Yes, yes, true faith is costly. There are many times when, you, when, when your, your family will not understand your commitment to Christ. They may even try to, to discourage you. But if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you will drop your net too and follow him. But not only are you trying to uh, make that commitment and become discouraged with family members, but, but, uh, but beloved, I want you to know sometimes you can come more discouraged with church family members and you got to keep Focus. You're going to have to keep moving forward. You're going to have to be like the old mule down in South Carolina where, uh, uh, when the mule was going all over the field. Uh, um, and, and, and my granddaddy 
and my and my and my, and my granddaddy, we used to go to the farm every summer. My dad used to take us down to the farm every summer, and uh, in St. Matthew, South Carolina, and we had a wonderful time. My granddaddy used to bring the mule out, and he put these binders on the mule, uh, uh, aside the mule, and I thought the mule was looking cool, but it was that he was trying to keep the uh, the keep. The, uh, the 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 mule focus because without the binders the 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 mule will go one or, or to the left or to the right but granddaddy want the mule to go straight and beloved i believe that's why we have the old testament and the new testament as our binders because god want to keep us focused to keep us focused second estimate before you enter, once you accept Christ as your Savior, there is no turning back. So Jesus said it is wise to consider the cause in the allegory fashion. Uh, he said, for which of you intend to build a tower, set it not down first and count the cause. Whether we, whether he has sufficient uh, to finish it. Follow me to rephrase, uh, rephrase, that, uh, rephrase that a bit. If you was going to build a tower, won't you first uh, sit down and plan the construction to make sure your heart was in the project? Christ's call to discipleship required us to take some measurements and these assessment of our sincerity and our of our commitment it is in is your heart is your heart in this thing called christianity can you commit can can you commit to the very end christian friends of mine this morning have you count the full cost of discipleship if you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will believe in his word. Amen. You will believe in his word. You know, it's a difference now. When I was coming up as a lad and now uh, 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 people, uh, they think you out of touch when you preaching from the word of God, the, the Holy Bible, or uh, even uh, uh, quoting the spirit of prophecy. They don't believe like we uh, uh, believe, uh, uh, like we used to. But if you're going to make it, beloved, we're going to have to believe in the word. It's not what the preacher said. It's not what your daddy said. It's not what your mama said. It is what the Bible said, believing in the word of God. Not only that, not only that, we must trust. We must trust the Savior. We must trust him. Regardless what the circumstances may be, we're going to have to trust him. Even in the darkest moment of our lives, we're going to have to trust him. I know a lot of folks are going through this coronavirus, beloved, but you got to trust him. Uh, 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 people have lost their job, but you got to learn how to trust him. Even though your spouse may walk out on you, but you learn how you got to learn how to trust him. And even in the church of the living God, regardless what other people do and what others say, you got to learn how to trust the Savior. Not only you must trust the Savior, you, from, uh, you uh, forget your past. You must resist the devil. And most of all, you must keep the faith. There will be burdens to carry. Are, are, are you up to it? There are lifestyle to change their lifestyle, there will be lifestyle change to change. Are you willing? There will be temptation uh, to overcome. Will you yield or you are uh, or you will resist? Of course. You won't have to build uh, this new life alone. Christ will be at our side. But some self-assessment is not the only necessary. It is essential. Otherwise, 
you will be just like the Demas in the church. For the Demas has uh, forsaken, uh, for, for 2 Timothy 4.10, for the Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed. Beloved, you know if we don't be careful, because you, your name is on the church roll does not mean you love Christ. Many of us love, love the world more than we love Christ. I'm talking about the cost of your cross. When Jesus said to his disciples, whosoever, uh, 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 whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. What he was really saying is, take up your cross and follow me. <laughs> because I am, and I am right, and they, and they, and they are wrong. As Christians, as Christians, we are called to follow, follow Christ to our death. This is just what the religious leader of the ancient time refused to do. It was too great of cost for them to bear. Uh, they could not, they could, listen to me, church, they could not, talking about the ancient, uh, talk, in ancient time, it, 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 was too, it was too great a cost for, uh, for them to bear. They could not give up their power, prestige, and position. They could not give up their power, prestige, or position. Don't you find like that? Don't you find it like that in the church today? Uh, 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 people uh, want power, they prestige, and they positions. Uh, the cross of self denial was too heavy for them to carry. But that the cost of discipleship. And it, and it is worth it. The Apostle Paul write, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Nevertheless, I am crucified with Christ. Beloved, have you been crucified yet? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Liveth in me. And beloved, uh, uh, and when Christ liveth in you, uh, uh, you don't have to go around bragging about it. You don't have to go around telling people about it. If Christ within you, people will know. People will know by your fruits. They will know. They will know. I don't know the full cost of your cross. You may have uh, lost uh, old friends or even a family who just cannot accept the change, uh, change in you. At times, you uh, at times, your cross may seem cruel and your load may seem too heavy. The challenge may seem too large and the task may seem too great, but, do, but do, do not be discouraged. I want you to know it's worth it. It's a challenge to keep on going when everybody else is, is stopped. But I want you to know today, Christian friends of mine, it's worth it. It's a challenge to hold on when the rest are, are letting go but I want you to know this morning, it's worth it. It's a challenge to stand firm when others are stumbling and staggling. But I want you to know today, it's worth it. It's a challenge to rely on God when others are denying God. But I want you to know, it's worth it. It is worth it because Christ is worth it. It is worth it because Christ died that you might live forever. Yes, Christ is worth the cost of your cross because he alone had the power to be your protector and provider. He can refresh you 
when you are weary because he is the fountain of the living waters. Uh, he can nourish you when you're feeling feeble because he is the true vine. He can, he can, uh, cl uh, he can calm, he can calm your calamity because he is the Prince of Peace. He can lift your, you, he can lift you from depression because he is a burden bearer. And you will never feel lost because he is the good shepherd. He, he is the bright and morning star. He guides you. He is the captain of our salvation. He will help you carry your cross. The Lord helped Joseph in the pit. And I want you to know, Christian friends of mine, he'll help you. Uh, the Lord helped Daniel in the, uh, the lion den. And I want you to know he'll help you. The Lord helped Samson in the king palace. And I want you to know he'll help you. The Lord helped Jeremiah under the Jupiter tree. And I want you to know he'll help you. The Lord helped his only begotten son carry Calvary cross. And I want you to know that he will help you. No matter what the cost to carry your cross, it will be it will pale in the shadow of the uh, uh, shadows of the uh, Christ cross. Christ beckon you, take up your cross and follow me. And beloved, we are too close. We are too close to give up. We got we got to hang, beloved. We got to hang in there. We got to hang in there because I believe that we are living on the very threshold of eternity. Let me tell you this story in closing. And um, last time I spoke, I talked about my granddaughter, Katie. Uh, Katie been with us all week, and, uh, but this is not by Katie today. Forty-something years ago, I was serving as an observer on the conference committee. Um, pa uh, pastor, uh, the late Pastor James Parham and I, I was pastoring in New Bern, North Carolina. He was pastoring in Kinston. And we decided it was too long of a drive to drive, fly down to Atlanta, so we decided we're going to fly. So I met him at the airport there in Kinston, a very small airport. Small, very small airport, but we got on that little plane, and we flew down to Atlanta, spending all day at the committee meeting. And after the committee meeting was over, we boarded a plane back to um, Kinston, North Carolina. But this time, this time, the plane did not fly directly from Kinston to Atlanta. This time, the plane left Atlanta and went to Asheville, North Carolina. And beloved, it was not bad, nice flight. But as we were looking at, as we was approaching uh, 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 the airport in Asheville, and as we were looking at the plane, we could not see the airport. Only thing we saw was mountains. Got a little weary there, but after a while, the plane landed. Praise the Lord. But then we left Asheville, North Carolina, on the way, we thought we thought to, to Kinston, but the plane had to stop again in Charlotte. A very short flight, very short flight, about a 30, 30, 40 minutes flight between Asheville and Charlotte. Beloved, we took off, and halfway through that flight, we ran into a storm. We ran into a storm. And beloved, that little plane that we was on began to feel more like a roller coaster than a plane. I saw people straighten up, acting all scared, reaching over, holding on to everyone, someone. And being a pastor, I couldn't act scared. I, even though I, were, I was scared, but I, 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 I act with dignity, but I was, beloved, I want you to know I was scared. I was scared. Uh, I, I thought about 
uh, uh, my family, my, my wife and our newborn son there back at home. And I say, the way this plane going, I may never get home again. And the pilot came over and said to us, he said, I'm so sorry, but since the distance is too short, I can't go above the storm and I can't go beneath the storm. I'm going to have to go through the storm. Oh, beloved. Oh, beloved. Again, that plane start to bouncing up and down, shifting from side to side. And we just, I just held on to my seat. It's strange to think, beloved, while I was on that plane, while we was on that plane, at least I, I'm not sure what the other one was thinking, but for me, I, one thing that never crossed my mind while I was on that plane, I never, I never thought about jumping off the plane. Never thought about it. How rough that plane was, I never, never crossed my mind Mel, it's time to jump out. No. I held my ground. And what I did, every time that plane bounced up and down, I just tightened up my seatbelt. I just tightened up my seatbelt and never thought about jumping off this plane. And beloved, I want you to know, uh, if you going to have to carry your cross, you can't jump off this plane uh, because, because, I, 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 I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought about Noah when he was preaching and, and they went into the ark. There was all kind of animals on, the, uh, on that ark. But Noah, if Noah had to say to Jesus, Jesus, uh, uh, Lord, uh, I'm not going on that ark. I'm not going to stay on this ark because all of these different kind of animals on here, he would have been lost. I look, at it, I look at the same thing today in the church. I love this church. And I'm not, and I'm not even think about leaving. But pastor, we got all kind of folks in the church. Yes, we, we, we got some mules. We got some donkeys. We got some giraffe. We got even some pigs. But let me tell you, don't jump off the ship. Don't jump off the ship. It is not who is on the ship, it's who guiding the ship. And just like, and, 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 and shortly later, a few minutes later, we made a clean cut sailing through that storm. And the pilot came across and said to us, folks, we have made it through the storm. One day, the great God of this great universe, we're going to hear his voice saying to his children, we have made it through the storm. No more death, no more dying, no more arthritis, no more COVID, uh, uh, no more heart attacks, no more disobedient folks, beloved, because we have made it through the storm. And whatever you are bearing, whatever I am bearing today, just count it as you bear in your cross because you and I have decided to follow Jesus. We have decided to make Jesus our choice and there is no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Father our God, we give thanks unto thee this day for Jesus Christ. And Lord, I know the challenge may be hard sometimes, but there's a cost for our cross. And beloved, some of us, some, all of us are going to have to pay a cost for our cross. And all of us have different challenges in, uh, today, but Lord, you're going to uh, bless us. But Lord, most of all, we ask that you would give us the strength that we need to bear our cross 
not only for this hour, but the hour to come. With, head, with your head bows and eyes still closed, uh, there may be someone today who have once had the cross, was carrying your cross, but it, got, it got too, just got too heavy for you, and you tossed it aside. But today you say, Lord, it's worth it. I'm going to pick up my cross again, and I'm going to carry it, and I know I can make it with your help. And if it's your desire to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, wherever you are, contact your pastor. Contact the conference office, um, wherever you are, and let them know that you have made a decision that you're going to follow Jesus Christ all the way, even into the watery grave of baptism. My prayers are with you. May God bless us and keep us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You were the word in the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sins were great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name
name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. I hear her being used by God. Forgive me, I was in a rush and forgot my mic. But I want to thank Pastor Preston for the message. I want to thank Sister Horton for the message in song. Now, as we are about to come to a conclusion, let me remind you of just a few things. Let me remind you of just a few things. Would you please keep um, Elder D.M. Jones' family in your prayers? Please keep uh, Pastor D.M. Uh, Jones family in your prayers as they try to make decisions. I know many of you have called wanting to know what is going to happen. We have not gotten the final word as of yet. However, when we get it, we will post it. We will let you know, but keep the family in prayer. Please remember to pray for Sister Kim Gator. Uh, Sister Gator is in the hospital. Even as we speak, I spoke to her this morning. Please keep her and her husband was in the hospital a little earlier this week. Please keep, the, he's out now, but she's still there. Please keep her in your prayers. Please remember um, Pastor Drake Barber's wife, um, that God will bless her and keep her um, as they are going through a serious medical ordeal. And then this week we heard that Pastor uh, Dominique Best, the pastor of our Orangeburg, uh, Denmark, South Carolina church, was in a serious car accident. That happened the first part of the week. Uh, he is home now. His wife called me on last evening. He is home now but he has quite a journey of recovery to go, so please keep that family in prayer. As stated earlier, we're just so happy that to have a, a new president and a vice president in the White House. Thank God for that. However, don't stop reading your Bibles because there are some things even President Biden, Vice President Harris cannot solve. Because at the end of the day, it's not about who has, uh, who had the most votes. We're in the midst of a great controversy. The fight is not just Republicans versus Democrats. Listen, Christian friends, we're in a great controversy. It's good versus evil. It's God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. And the Bible told us it's going to get worse instead of getting better because the devil will be loose for the season. So I'm happy that, that, that we have a new president. I'm thrilled we have a new vice president. But my hope is built on nothing less. I'm going to keep holding on to Jesus. Please, please do that. <sighs> We want to remind you of something that's going to happen. If you go to the conference website, South Atlantic Conference website, you will see a flyer on there. There is a great um, emphasis that we will be placing on evangelism starting this coming Friday night at 7 o'clock. 
January the, thir- the 29th, January the 29th through the 31st. There it is. Uh, Extreme Makeover uh, featuring one of our own, uh, Pastor Daniel Kelly with the different panelists. There you see them. Uh, you want to you join us on Friday evening at 7 o'clock and then next Sabbath evening at 4 o'clock and next Sunday evening at 4 o'clock. Yes, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We cannot get together. We've been admonished by the powers that be that we should not really be in churches. And so we're trying to work with that. However, we cannot stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we invite you to this workshop. It's awesome. It's breathtaking. It's educational. It's enlightening. Come join us on Friday night. There you see, just come to the website. We'll be on Facebook. We'll be on YouTube. We'll be live on our website please join us from seven o'clock we'll be finished by 8 15 on saturday evening four o'clock to 5 15 sunday four o'clock to 5 15 next weekend please set that aside please uh, put a note to yourself remind yourself to join us because our our commission from the master is to go and preach and teach and tell others of the soon coming jesus christ and what an excellent time to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that it's not about winning the lottery, it's about being ready for the master to return. Then last but not least, before we pray, please keep your mask close by your side and wear it. Please wash your hands. Our Christian friends, whether you think it's a host, whether you think they're trying to put some sh- a chip in a in a vaccine i'm not here to debate any of what you think what i am here to tell you four hundred thousand people plus around the world has died from this virus it's real it's serious so please wear your mask wash your hands This thing is real. More people have died from the virus, they said, than were killed in World War II. Please, please, Christian family, please, please follow the rules from CDC. Let us bow our heads in prayer. We thank you, Master, for the message. We thank you for the word today. Let it not fall on deaf ears or hard hearts but help us to open ourselves up and receive it so that we can be the men and the women, the boys and the girls that you would have us to be. We thank you for the music today, for the songs of Zion that reminded us that you're still in control. We've come to the end of our service, but Master, please, in the name of Jesus, keep each one of us this week in the palm of your divine hand. Watch over us like you put a hedge around Job, put a hedge around each one of us and keep us, we pray, because we want to be ready when thou shall come. Now, this, now, have faith in God. Fast fates the dying day. Have faith in God. Watch and pray. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and Holy Ghost powers. Until Friday night when we shall tune in for Extreme Makeover, the church talking about evangelism, and then on next Sabbath morning as we come come back together to worship you in spirit and in truth is our prayer In the awesome, mighty name of Jesus, let all of God's children everywhere say, Amen.